This entitled mom has gone so crazy that she thinks kidnapping her own child will somehow save them. Who on earth can save them? Or is it too late? Happy birthday, today's your birthday and on with the revamped show. This happened when I was a kid. I want to say around 7 or 8, so I can't really remember. Well, except for being in brownies. Girl guides. My brother reminded me of this story and said I should post it here, so here we go. Little backstory. When I was a kid, I hated milk and cereal, mainly because I've always been the type that can't force themselves to eat right after waking up. Once it got soggy, I couldn't eat it without feeling like I was going to bath. It's a weird thing with food textures. Never liked eating over soft foods. My mum was cool with this. Just put my milk in a glass and let me eat it dry. Still do this from time to time depending on the cereal, but I've gotten over this for the most part. Anyways, not long after, I and my younger were in school full time. My mum decided to go back to school. I think for a secretarial school. All I remember is the typewriter she had to learn to use. So me and my brother started getting dropped off at a friend's of hers when she was on her way to school, and we would catch the school bus with her two kids. This friend was one of the leaders in Brownies, called Owls, and was second, Tawny Owl, behind the leader, Brown Owl. And my mum was third in the pecking order, Snowy Owl. The sitter's oldest kid was also a girl in my Brownie group, and it was how we all met and became friends. My mum would always bring a box of cereal, a jug of milk, and some other snacks for us to have at the sitter's place. The sitter knew full well that I didn't eat my cereal with milk in it, and didn't have an issue for several months before she decided to give me my breakfast with milk in it, telling me something along the lines of, I'm tired of washing extra dishes for you. It was an extra cup, that's all. I ate as much as I could, but the cereal turned soggy and I had had enough. She made me sit there, not allowed to leave until I ate it all, but I couldn't. I tried and I nearly barfed. She took the cereal before the bus came and we went to school. Here I thought it would be over, but I wouldn't be writing this if that was the case. After school, she sat me down at the table and put that bowl of cereal in front of me. Yep, you read that right. She put cereal that had been sitting in her fridge for about nine hours in front of me and told me I couldn't go play until I ate the cereal. I just sat there, stirring it, but didn't eat it, feeling ill just looking at it. She took it just before my mum arrived and me and my brother went home. The next morning she did it again. Same bowl of cereal. Again I didn't eat it and wasn't even allowed to move to go to the washroom. She did the same thing after school and at breakfast the following day. On the third day she packed the cereal in a takeout container and sent it to school with me, along with a note to my teacher telling her that I wasn't allowed to eat my lunch until I ate the cereal. She even told me she would call the teacher to make sure I gave the note to her. So I did. My teacher read the note and took the container. The teacher asked me if this is what the sitter tried to give me to eat and I nodded, thinking I was in trouble. The teacher opened the container, had a horrified look on her face. The contents were starting to smell and sent me down to the library. Not too long later, my mum arrived at the school with McDonald's for me. She was livid. That night at the sitters all heck broke loose. My brother were picked up by my mum and she drove to the sitters and she went in the house. We could hear her yelling from outside. My mum has an amazing gift for voice projection, but not what she was saying. But given that it was about 30 years ago, I wouldn't remember it anyways. She never sent us back to that sitter and we ended up having to transfer to another brownie group because the sitter got the other kids to stop playing with me and turned into little jerks. Thankfully, my grandmother had moved in with us and she started watching us before and after school each day. Imagine being so petty. You dislike this child's preferences so much that you basically prevent them from eating food, which is kind of, you need to do that to live, you know? They're a defenseless kid, like what can they do? Even when they went to the teacher, they thought they were the one that was gonna be in trouble. It's just messed up to think that you would have the right to be able to do that to a kid. They're vulnerable and need to be taken care of and that was your responsibility. And instead of doing that, you did the complete opposite. At least her mum stood up for her and yelled at her afterwards. Also, she got some McDonald's, so you know, that's a win too. I'm a sales manager in the beauty industry. Most of my team are industry veterans that need very little managing, but seasonally, we bring in part-timers. 
typically high school or college girls, wanting to try out the beauty industry, get some training, discounts and free product, and $20 an hour. The way our hiring works is that our employees are hired by two different companies. First the department store and then the vendor. The store and the vendor, me, split their hourly. This department store had a very generous discount program for their employees, starting at 20% and going up to 40. This included designer products as well, so the savings are huge. The store has a policy that you can share your discount with your spouse but no one else. No parents, siblings or friends. It's considered theft and is grounds for termination. You can't buy things and resell them for a profit either. Most people bend that rule a little bit. Pick up a shaving cream for their dad or whatever. But as long as you're the one that buys it with your card, you'll never get caught. Basically, don't be a greedy, arrogant dummy. We hired a senior in high school, seasonally, who like me is a first generation immigrant. In her interview with me, she talked about makeup artistry being her gift, and she wanted to develop it into a career to support her family and build a great life. That's exactly what makeup did for me, so I was very touched. She told me how our brand in particular was her favorite, and how much she wanted to attend our training seminars. After a couple of weeks, a woman comes in and is speaking to her very aggressively in Mandarin. I'm assuming this is a customer. I don't tolerate customers mistreating my team and will kick them out. So I walked up and asked what the problem was. Turns out it was her mother. She had a large pile of expensive fragrances, multiple bottles of the same fragrance from Chanel. She dropped the pile and stormed out. Seasonal employee apologized for her mum's behavior and put the bottles back. A month later, I'm at another store location and spot the mother again, buying multiple bottles of Chanel and Tom Ford fragrance with $25 gift cards. I observe her without her knowing and see that she used her daughter's employee discount. I have no choice but to report it. Turns out that the employee's mother had been buying department store gifts from Fred Meyer and getting points from them, then using that department store's phone number rewards number system to get more points. Buying thousands of dollars worth of products with her daughter's discount and reselling it. It's really pretty genius and we never would have caught on. Gift cards aren't traceable data if she hadn't used her phone number for additional points with the store. When we terminated the girl, she told us she had begged her mum not to do it, and this wasn't just a job. We were going to fly her to California for training and certify her, and she was getting to work with some of the most accomplished artists in the field. But the mum said she had sacrificed so much to raise her that this was the least her daughter could do. With enough bullying from her mum, the daughter gave in and let it go. Now she won't get a job with any line, because no store will hire you after you're fired for fraud. It's sad when you've got these entitled parents that are almost like evil geniuses. They come up with something that's actually pretty clever, like they had to use their intellect to think about how all that would work. But they don't use it for good, instead they always use it for evil. It's just heartbreaking because she's not taking that much risk, I don't think there was much penalty for her. Instead, it's her daughter that takes all the risk, and eventually, she's the one that has to pay the consequence. It's not like she was in on it either, she didn't want the mum to do it. I hope things turn out for her, it just would suck to be in a situation like that. In the cast, me, my entitled mother, and my dad. Supporting cast members, my dad's girlfriend, my mum's sane older sister, and some cops. Chapter 1, The Backstory. Getting right into it, my parents aren't exactly on the best of terms. Actually, they haven't been on remotely decent terms for a while now. After their 22 year marriage, they got a divorce back in mid 2013, when I was in the sixth grade. Exact dates are a bit hazy, but I'd say it was around April or May of that year. It was quite bitter. I don't think the things my parents said to each other in the courtrooms are appropriate here, but long story short, they freaking hated each other. After the divorce proceedings started, I lived with my mum at our old house. She started spewing a bunch of BS accusations about the fact that your father is the worst human being on the planet, he's corrupting your mind, and a lot more hateful, untrue stuff. But I was only 11, which was way too young to know that it was actually BS. I just blindly accepted it as fact because that's what I'd been more or less raised to do. But this was only the beginning. At this point, the monitored visits started happening. This was about early to mid-March 2014. Also, if you're wondering why they were monitored, it was because on a scale of 1 to 10, my parents' level of trust in each other was at a negative 117,000 million. 
Anyways, for a few hours every Saturday, I was handed off to my dad and we'd hang out somewhere, like K1 Speed or his parents' house. Then I was given back to my mother and I'd go about my existence as an annoying as heck 11 year old. Not ashamed to admit it, I was pretty weird. Then a plot twist happened. More like life twist, but you get the idea. Over Thanksgiving break in 7th grade, my dad got full custody of me. I went to live with him in his bachelor pad and I thought that was that. But my mum was livid. I had to say it. Whenever we had visits, she would try to pull me to the side and tell me not to listen to my dad. To tell him I didn't want to live with him or some other bullcrap. But the monitor would step in because that wasn't allowed. Just like the rest of the stuff she did after this point. I continued middle school, my grades got heaps better, and monitored visits started again. But this time with my mum. Only the visits were a little different, important later. Me and my dad drove to a drop off point, a park close to my mum's house. I was given to the monitor, then we drove to my mum's house. Did stuff, then went back to the drop off point and I went back to my dad's place. It was also at this point in my life where I learned to not blindly accept things my parents said as fact. Unless it was actually true, duh. This was because I learned that what my mum said about my dad wasn't true. I started questioning her reasoning, but I didn't tell anyone. In hindsight, I should have. I didn't really know who to trust anymore, or who to listen to. Life was, somehow, as normal as it could have been for someone in my situation. That is until Monday, April 6, 2015. Maybe all this wouldn't have happened if it wasn't a Monday, I think to myself in my fevered imagination. Chapter 2, the part where it gets interesting. On this fateful day was when everything got turned completely upside down. At first it was just like any other Monday visit. I went to her house, only she wasn't waiting on the porch as usual. She was in front of the house in her car. I thought, okay, that's a little weird, and thought nothing of it. When we pulled into the driveway, the monitor and I in her car, my mum pulled forward and blocked the monitor's car in. When we got out of the car, she was yelling at me to get in the car which I, stupidly, did because I didn't know any better. The monitor rushes over and says, No, you can't do this! This is against the rules! My mother responds with, No, I'm protecting him from his crappy father! Or something along those lines. I don't know, I was in the car and couldn't hear. Apparently from what I learned later on, she physically assaulted the monitor before getting in the car and driving off. As we pulled away, I don't remember exactly what she said, but it was probably something like, we're going to go start a better life for ourselves, somewhere we can forget all our problems and start over. Some other BS. We get to LAX about half an hour after the visit was scheduled to end, and she asks me where I want to go. I say Washington DC, because I'd never been there before. But we ended up hitching a flight to Chicago for some reason. I'll never forget what I said to myself as we took off. There goes my life as I know it. And wouldn't you know it, I was right. When we landed, we were called off the plane and detained for questioning. My mother and I were put in separate rooms, but the whole time, I could hear her repeating, I had to do what I had to do to protect my son. I got no sleep that night because those words were haunting me the whole time. The next day, I was sent on a solo flight back to LAX. That was my first time flying alone. But before I left, my mother said to me, When you get there, tell my dad that you don't want to live with him anymore. Deep down, I knew that the proper course of action was electing to ignore that stupid decision. But me being the idiot 12 year old I was, I said I'd do that. You know, like a liar. John Mulaney, is that you? On the way back home from LAX, my dad told me that the incident had made the news. In the clip that he showed me, my dad summed it up perfectly. It's worse than hell. I don't know what hell is like, but this is it for me. The next day at school, everyone was like, Whoa, what the heck happened? We saw you in the news last night and thought you died. And in some twisted way, they were right. For the next few years, my mum would be in and out of jail for repeat violations of a court-ordered restraining order because she kept trying to sign me out of school. I'll never forget how on edge I was when she did this for the first time. But as the years went on, she did this throughout my freshman, sophomore and junior years, I became sort of uncomfortably numb to her repeated special guest appearances in my life. The last straw was when she showed up at my house over this past summer. Not once, not twice, but on three distinct occasions. Now it was my turn to be livid. On a court-mandated Skype call on a Tuesday night with my mum's older sister and her mum, 
who are, unlike my birth giver, sane. My mum kept poking her head in, trying to see me. At that point, I had had just about enough, and I exploded. I finally called her out on her bullcrap. In hindsight, there were some things I should have said, and maybe some stuff I shouldn't have said. But that night was one of the best of my life. I finally felt that I had a sense of closure, and that she finally understood how she was affecting me, except for the fact that she didn't understand. That Saturday, me and my dad spotted her on the main road next to my house. Again. We immediately reported it to the police, and she was picked up soon after that. She currently resides in jail. Chapter 3 Epilogue The ending to this crap show is somewhat of a bittersweet one. Sweet because she'll be in jail for the rest of my senior year, and thus I don't have to worry about her showing up again. The bitter part is having to figure out how to prepare for when she is eventually let out, and the aftermath that may or may not ensue shortly thereafter. It's, well, a crap show more than anything, but it's life. Not a good life, but life nonetheless. My dad and his girlfriend have been extremely supportive in this matter, and I can't thank them enough. As for me, I've been trying to live my best life, and after a significant bout of depression, I feel like I'm coming out on top. I think for most people when they say, oh, when life hands you lemons, just make lemonade, and that can fit into a relatively simple understanding of like, oh, sometimes bad things happen in your life and try and make the most out of it. Unfortunately for some people, their situation, it's a lot worse than lemons. So any chance they have to make a better life for themselves, any amount of people that they have around them to help them get through it, it's like a breath of fresh air. Submit your story to be read on the channel at voiceyhearstories at gmail.com and join our Voicey Veteran community at r slash voiceyhear. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to never miss an episode. Alright Voicey Veterans, I'll see you in the next one.